I'm not an engineer, I'm not a designer, I'm not a professional fabricator. I like making stuff, I like figuring things out. I love race cars. Look, all you really need to know about me is I once put nitrous oxide on the Lotus Europa and I used to race at the SECA in a Formula 500. And if you don't know what that is, go look it up. If you do, you get that I make bad life choices. Uh, and through a series of bad choices, I came to build my own sort of GT40. But if we're talking bad decisions, we should probably start with the first race car I built from scratch. It's loosely based on the Lotus Type 38 that won the 1965 Indianapolis 500 with Jim Clark driving. Uh, obviously, it's not an exact tool room copy. Uh, some of that's my limitations in fabricating ability. Some of that is parts availability. I wanted it to be made with parts I could get easily, especially in this country, and affordably. And then the other thing is I'm a lot taller than Jim Clark, so it's longer. So it's, it's an aluminum monocoque from here up to here. And you can, you can see here it's got a little steel subframe structure for the front suspension. And then it's got a, a steel-made bulkhead here and then... Uh, around the the engine bay and for the rear suspension and the original car would have been aluminum all the way back here uh, I have to do weird things because of the way this transmission mounts But being my first car, you know, you, you pick up a piece of aluminum and it's just flopping around It's just sheet metal. You haven't formed it or anything and you just think I don't want to put a 400 pound engine in that um, And I've, I've gained a lot of confidence having done this and, and seen how, how ridiculously strong things get once they're all done but when I did this I put a, a triangulated steel structure back here and I just covered it in thin aluminum to look like a monocoque so you didn't know I was cheating the whole car uh, with fluids and everything in it weighs about 1400 pounds so it's a Ford 302 I got it from a guy who had it uh, in a Cobra replica and he was stepping up to a stroker motor so he took the top of his engine and put it on the stroker short block and gave me a short block and I put on Aluminum heads and intake manifold and headers, carburetor. The gearbox is an Audi 016 out of an Audi 5000. Uh, but like the engine, uh, I got it from a guy who had a GT40 replica. So I got that with the adapter plate. Uh, the rear suspension uses uh, Ford late 90s T-Bird knuckles, which is what a lot of guys uh, that had Cobras that were doing independent rear suspension were using. So I saw that as a good you know, parts I could get pretty easily. And I got these new from Ford. Since then, uh, they're becoming harder and harder to find and, and Ford's discontinued them. Uh, and the rear suspension looks a little funny because I tried to be faithful to the original car's uh, geometry, its roll centers uh, and whatnot, uh, but I had to adapt it with these knuckles that are designed for a vehicle that's got much higher uh, pickup points on the chassis. The front uh, spindles are Mustang 2 ones, which I found hot rod guys use Mustang 2 suspension. And because of that, there's a lot of different versions. There's a lot of modified versions. So you can get a standard ride height, a one inch drop. These are two inch drops. And then instead of the nine inch brakes that they would have had originally, these have 11 inch brakes. Somebody was just saying the other day, it's like, oh, you must have a great shop for, for building this kind of stuff. I built it in a dog run. It's like an oversized kennel thing. I was making the chassis there, and when the chassis got too big, a friend of mine and I picked it up and carried it into the driveway, and I just finished it in the driveway. I was trying to build it on a budget of $10,000, and it ended up being about twelve. dollars uh, And most everything on it is, is pretty easy to get. Actually, the things that aren't easy to get uh, are, I have to make them myself, uh, the suspension things. Uh, and that's fine. They're still cheap, they just take time. One of, the, one of the cool moments with it was when I was, when I was building it, and I don't think I had the, this engine in it, but I had a mock-up block and, and it was dressed, so it looked like an engine. Uh, and I finally had everything together to assemble the brakes and, and the suspension at every corner. And up until this point, the car's just been this metal tube. And so I was busy working on each corner. I think I'd done three corners and just my head's down doing all these things, and the phone rang inside the house. You remember that when, when phones were inside the house? And 
And I went and answered the phone, and then I came back out, and I saw the car. And I, you know, it didn't have wheels on, but it had brakes, which looked like small wheels. Uh, but there, the suspension and everything, and it, it just struck me like, holy cow, th this is a car. Uh, and it's, it's just like any cigar-shaped vintage racer from back in the day. It was one of these moments where I couldn't believe the thing existed, and I never feel like, like, wow, good for me, I did that. It's, I can't believe this exists, and I really don't believe I had anything to do with it. Um, it's just this amazing thing suddenly in the driveway. I never, you know, building it, I didn't expect it to work, uh, but I figured I would just keep working on it until it did work. But I've been driving it for six years now. Um, I got four championships with the Golden Gate Lotus Club by being in a class that's poorly contested and showing up more than anybody else. It's the only way I know how to win. There's the spirit. It's still a hole in the back. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of fun. One of the advantages that I've had has been the opportunity to go to the historic races at Laguna Seca for, I think, over 20 years now. Uh, I'm able to get up close to a lot of the famous machinery, see it with their bodies off, different panels off, uh, different states of disassembly. You know, you see other people there and they're taking a selfie of themselves next to some championship winning race car. And I'm there taking close-ups of front suspension packaging. Clearly, I'm a blast at parties. Period pictures contribute a lot uh, that you find in books uh, these days. Uh, there are so many amazing pictures out there. Uh, and you can actually derive measurements from them. If you know certain things like, say, you know that they use 15-inch wheels. Well, especially if you've got a nice profile picture, profile, you know, side picture, uh, and you know that wheel is 15 inches, well, then you can extrapolate different dimensions of the car. Um, and, and usually, you know, it's easy to go on the internet and find out the, the track of a car, the wheelbase, um, length, height, sometimes ground clearance, uh, ride height kind of things. Um, so, so the more measurements you can get, the more you can figure out, the more it's just kind of connecting the dots. If the car is riveted, which a lot of the aluminum cars were riveted back then, most of the time that rivet pitch, the space between the rivets is one inch, or sometimes it's one and a half inches or it's two inches, but you can usually tell. And if they're one inch rivet space, you just count the rivets and you know how long something is. When you've got all these pieces of information, you can put it together enough that you're gonna be pretty darn close. In fact, when I did the GT40 chassis, I did my measurements that way. I purposely made the chassis so that I had a little leeway so that the, the body could sit on it either an inch forward or an inch back in case I didn't quite get it right. And I was able to, to measure a guy's uh, replica GT40 and my center point on the measurements was all dead on. That's not to say I'm so amazing or anything, I'm just trying to say you can do that just from pictures. Uh, much more specific and, and detailed information, uh, I get from actually reading books, not just looking at the pictures. Um, and we live in an amazing age where you can get books written by the actual designers from these famous race cars. Len Terry, who did the 38, uh, Mike Costin at Lozis, uh, Tony Southgate, who worked at Lola and then went on to a varied and very successful career. I, Eric Broadley doesn't have one, uh, but there's books about Eric Broadley, and there's plenty on, on Colin Chapman at Lotus. Oh, uh, Gordon Murray uh, uh, with Brabham and McLaren stuff. And what's great about these is they generally don't give you a recipe for the race car, although Len Terry kind of does at the back of his book. He gives you, here's what thickness of what metal you should use where and why, uh, just you know, general guidelines and, and, and the, the alloys to use. But what you get from them is you get their philosophy and you get what they're trying to accomplish. So, so they'll talk about uh, their ideas on roll centers, what they like to shoot for with um, weight distribution, car lengths, moments of polar inertia, pickup points, things like that. 
you get their philosophies on it. And that's way more helpful because I'm not building tool room copies of these cars. Besides, I don't have the fabricating ability to do that. I don't fit in these cars. So if I'm building a car for me, I want, I want to be able to fit. So I'm going to have to change the dimensions. So it's more useful to me to know what it was they were trying to achieve uh, and their philosophies on, on how to go about that uh, and their preferences for different things than it is to know, hey, this goes here and this goes here and insert tab A into tab B. There's also these wonderful books uh, from Haynes uh, where they created what they call Haynes manuals, but they're of famous racing cars. And they, and they do have military vehicles and the space shuttle and the SR-71. And, and it always has a history of the vehicle and stuff. Usually it's something that's now been restored. So there'll be stuff about restoration, how it's used today, but they'll talk about the designs and stuff. And for my uses, they're a little bit of a crapshoot. Some of them are absolutely amazing where not only do you get all the general technical data on the car, you get what alloy of aluminum was used where, uh, at what gauge, and when it changed because the regulation changed, and what the suspension was when it started, and then they, the thing they tried next, and the thing they tried next. Some of them are just amazing like that. And some of them, when you get into the nitty gritty, say something like, here's a picture of the front suspension, which was short long arm. Notice you can see the steering arm. Like, what am I supposed to do with that? I'm sure the average person's fine with that. They're not looking to do what I'm looking to do. So I, I don't mean to complain, but I am going to complain, yes. Once I've got all the key dimensions that I can, I can get my hands on, I lay it out uh, on graph paper. I like to do a scale where it, the graph paper's got quarter inch squares, so I just make each square an inch. I try to draw everything from as many angles as possible. Um, that really forces you to think through everything uh, and, and, and find any problems while you're still in the design phase. Um, something that's happened on other projects is you, you've got it all laid out and you're, you're building it and it's usually the rear suspension because you've got the control arms and the drive shaft and the spring all vying for the same space. And you go to put it all together and you realize, oh, well, I can't put this here because this is going through at this angle it just never occurred to me because I looked at it from this view and I looked at it from this view but I didn't look at it from a weird angle like that and if I would put in the time I should just be doing this in CAD but they didn't have CAD back then so uh, I like working on graph paper it's fun it's, it's, it's a quick way to lay it out and then it's easy to have that uh, next to me when I'm actually cutting the sheet metal and, and marking lines out on it where things are going to rivet together or, or making, a, uh, making a jig or something for, for welding. There is one other thing I do, and <clears throat> this tends not to be with the exact final design. I kind of do this to help work through the problems, but uh, I'll make a quarter scale mock-up, again, with the graph paper, but in three dimensions. So um, this is not exactly what I did with the GT40 but uh, it's close, this is an early version, and this helps me to see problems and see where I'm getting things wrong. Uh, and you can even, now obviously this is missing some important pieces of metal uh, that it would need to be, or paper in this case, uh, that it would need to be structurally sound, uh, but you can take it and you can flex it. To be fair, this model has been around for three years now, and it's had a rough time of me flexing it, but it's surprisingly stiff for just being taped together graph paper. But you can see where the weak points are uh, and figure out what you need to do to sure that up. This was the result. It looks like a GT40 Mark II, uh, but it's made mostly out of aluminum and at 1900 pounds, it's about 600 pounds lighter than an original. If you want to talk originality, I could talk all day about what's not right on this car versus an original GT40, but that's not what I was trying to do. What I wanted to do was to design my own chassis with some ideas that I had, uh, but I didn't want to have to do a body. So I designed a chassis that would fit under a GT40 body. Ready-made good looks, you know? There's no concessions for comfort or road use. Uh, it's just designed to be fast and a ton of fun, uh, but also, uh, inexpensive to maintain and run uh, that's why you get things like the five bolt wheels instead of the center locks and it's got a polycarbonate windshield uh, things like that we'll talk more about that later 
really it's just meant to be a ton of fun uh, while preferably being faster than cars that are more expensive than it uh, which it helps that I did this on a pretty tight budget uh, about twenty five thousand dollars I use the car mostly at autocrosses I've got my first real track day coming up in a couple months now that I've had a year of driving it under my belt and I'm sure it's not just looking for an excuse to explode on me I think it's the most fun car I've ever owned. I, I've owned a lot of fun cars, uh, but the way you can chuck this into a corner and sort it out later, uh, I haven't had before. I've had cars that were faster than this, but you had to be really precise. I've had cars that were faster than this and just sucked to drive. Uh, but this one is plenty quick, but it is fun to just throw around the track. It's really forgiving. Uh, it, that allows you to, to drive it at the limit. You don't have to be afraid of like, oh, if I go over, it's going to bite me. It's like, no, no, you can go over the limit a little bit and you can catch it and, and correct. And that, that keeps you so you can always be right there on the limit. And that's just a ton of fun. It's 6 a.m. You ready to go? Yeah. Where are we going? Autocross. Should we go? Yes, let's go. Okay. Let's put this in the proper context. This was our first event. <laughs> this is out the naval field at uh, Crow's Landing. It was an all across put on by the Golden Gate Lotus Club. Great group of guys. Um, I like pl I like screwing around with my cars at autocrosses anyways, and it's a great safe way uh, to start chassis tuning. Again, I've, I've put springs in the car based on certain formulas uh, and certain known things like the cycles per minute of, of cars in period and, and whatnot. But really at this stage, it's an educated guess because nobody has ever driven this car that weighs this amount with this weight distribution, with this suspension geometry, with these springs on these tires ever before. So you kind of just need to, to find out what's gonna, you can take an educated guess and then you, you go from there. And I brought a bunch of different springs to see uh, what would happen. But what happened was it was a little tail happy. Undrivable is probably too strong of a term, but definitely unraceable. You could not come into a corner with any amount of speed, and you could not exit a corner with any kind of speed uh, without just going all the way around. But that was fun, and my kid used to complain all the time that I wasn't sideways enough in my other car, and so it wasn't exciting enough for him. Uh, so, so the second time the car starts I, I realize oh, I've lost it. I'm not going to recover from this spin. The, the, the back's coming out. I realized I was right across the track from where my kid was filming. And I thought, great, I'm right in front of him. I'm going to do a donut. I'm going to spin all around. He's going to love it. Kind of giggled a little bit, and that was it. This part here where it looks like my kid is celebrating or being really excited about what the car did, this is just clever editing. Uh, he's actually... Uh, cheering on this guy who did a bigger donut right in front of him, which that made his day, but his dad in a GT40. When I started the project, he was really into to GT40s, and it took about two years to make it, by by the end, he was like, oh, I don't like GT40s anymore. Uh, and he, he bugged me, he was like, well, Dad, why didn't, why didn't you build a Ferrari, this new SP3, why didn't you build that? Uh, why don't you build a Pagani, Dad? Come on. <laughs> and so I took him to the event, and I thought maybe seeing other people's reactions will get him to realize that this is something special, that not everybody has a GT40, uh, especially one they built themselves. And so I asked him afterwards, uh, I mean, we were in the car on the way home, and there's a guy in a new C8 Corvette, and I can see him slow down as he comes to pass me on the freeway, and he's got his phone out, and he's, he's taking pictures or video of, of the car. I'm like, see, pe people are excited about this. So I ask him, well, did you hear other people at the event while you were filming uh, talk about the car? And he goes, oh, yeah. Anytime I could hear what people were saying, it would just be GT40 this and GT40 that, and i just have to roll my eyes. So, yeah. There's no impressing that kid.
I shouldn't say that. I guess I could build a Pagani. Yeah.